I am very thrilled to be your host for the day, and I am even more thrilled to have our special guest, Dr. Duncan, with us. Um, Dr. Duncan has been with us in the past, and I can tell you, you are going to walk away feeling very fulfilled um, about some real cool environmental aspects. So today we have Dr. Duncan with us, and she is an international consultant and author of seven books that are all focused on environmental design of early childhood spaces. She's a designer of two furniture collections called The Sense of Place and Sense of Place for Wee Ones, and an adjunct faculty at Nova Southeastern University. She's designed and taught university courses and built early learning environments from the ground up, collaborating with architects, interior designers, and educators to create some really extraordinary and inspirational spaces and places for our youngest children. Um, her vision is truly to preserve the miracle and magic of children through indoor and outdoor space environments today. We are so excited to have you here today, Dr. Duncan. Um, audience, I am going to ask that you can mute your microphones and turn off our videos so that we can just truly focus on Dr. Duncan's presentation. Dr. Duncan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be with you all today. So uh, the title of our presentation is Inspiring Environments for Young Children, A Fresh Perspective. The information that you're going to receive from this presentation is based on two books that I co-authored with four other authors, Jessica Devinney, Sarah Harris, Marianne Rohde, and Lois Rosenberry. You can find this book at Griffin House um, a website. The the first book is Inspiring Spaces for Young Children, and the second book is a rating observation scale. It's a scale for observing the elements that we're going to talk about today. So what we're going to talk about today are seven principles of design, and it sort of is a new perspective. Um, when we first started talking about these principles of design, it was a new idea, and the idea was designing from an aesthetic viewpoint rather than a functionality viewpoint. Many of us design our environments based on function. So for example, if we want to decide where to put the art center, we probably will put it next to the source of water or maybe on a tile floor. Or if we want to put our block center somewhere, we think about, oh, we better put it over in a corner out of the way, out of the tra traffic pattern of the children and the adults. If we want to design a quiet area, a library area in our classroom, we look for a, a, perhaps a little cozy nook or a, a place out of the way of um, the, the noise, if there is such a thing in an early childhood classroom. So most of our design of our classroom and the layout of our classroom, it's done on functionality. What the Inspiring Spaces um, book asks you to do is to think about your, your designing your environment from a totally new perspective. And that is the perspective of aesthetics or of beauty. And we're gonna talk about that in just a few moments. So <clears throat> today with the seven principles of design, we're going to help you take your classroom from good to inspiring. So we all have good classrooms. We work hard at our classrooms and designing our classrooms. This is presentation isn't to say that your classroom isn't good. Our, all of our classrooms are good. What it is to say is maybe we can take it one notch upward. Maybe we can take it from good to inspiring. And so if you look at this image right here, and thank you, Jessica Devaney, Sarah, um, Lois, and Marianne Rohde for this, um, this image. 
if you and some of the images that images you'll see in this presentation. But if you look at this image and you see this classroom, this classroom is a good classroom. It's a very good classroom. But what we're going to do is we're going to apply the seven principles to our good classrooms and we're going to take them to inspiring. So take a close look at this image. This is a classroom that we worked on and we apply the seven principles of design and we took it up a notch and we took it to inspiring. So the next image you're going to see is an image where we apply the seven principles of design. So take one last look and here we go. Look at that, that's totally different. Yet it's the same classroom, but we've just applied the seven principles of design that you're going to learn about today. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the relationship between beauty and cognition and thinking about it as a three-part circle. So if you just imagine a pie and it's divided into three slices of pie, so the first slice of pie, the number one slice of pie, is the idea that inspiring spaces are places of beauty. So if you look at that last word, beauty, and let's go to the second slice of pie. Beauty promotes a sense of wonder. So if we have beauty in our classroom, we have a sense of wonder. And we do know from the research that wonder promotes lifelong learning. And so as you begin to think about your classroom in terms of inspiring and not just functionality, not just designing according to function, but in start thinking about your classroom designing according to inspiration and inspiring, then you begin to understand what where we're going to go with this presentation. So remember that beauty promotes a sense of wonder. Aesthetically pleasing classrooms promote a sense of wonder. Wonder promotes lifelong learning. So that's what we want to do. That's where we want to be. As teachers of young children, our goal is to help children become lifelong learners, right? So designing classrooms that are inspiring is one way to reach that goal. So let's begin then with the seven principles of design. The first principle is called nature inspires beauty. The idea behind this principle is to infuse nature in all spaces and in all places. Many times when I go into classrooms, I do see perhaps a plant or perhaps a fish. And a lot of times those that plant and that fish might be in the science corner. But what we need to do is think about inspiring and infusing nature into all all places, all spaces of our classroom, even on the walls, even from the ceiling perhaps, even on the floor, in all spaces and places. And why do we need to do that? Well, research indicates that children who have frequent interactions with nature have increased academic success. And if you wanna learn more, about the relationship between academics and nature. Just go to www.natureexplore.org and they have plenty of white papers that will talk you through why we should be including nature into our classroom. Nature definitely instills beauty. And I got this uh, little chart from Sally Hoy, who is the founder of Fairy Dust Teaching. You may know about her. If you don't, go look up Fairy Dust Teaching website. It's easy to find. And she will become your instant 
companion in creating inspiring environments. So what she said was, if you look at this chart and you look at the left and you see living and you look at the far right and you see non-living, what she says is there is a direct relationship between calmness in the room and lack of calmness. The more living items that you have in your classroom, the calmer your classroom will become. The less living items that you have in your classroom, the less calm it will become. So I want you to think about this for just a moment because it's very, very important. If you look on the left-hand side, living means nature, green, plants, flowers, fish, anything that's living. Organic means materials, branches, rocks, shells. Those are kinds of organic items. So that, those are good items to have in the classroom. But look on the far right, non-living is plastic and man-made materials. So think about the relationship, be, or uh, think about the ratio of non-living things that you have in your classroom versus living things that you have in your classroom. And the reality is, the reality is most of us have more non-living things in our classroom than we have living. And the majority of our stuff many times is plastic. So I urge you to think about that plastic factor and see if you could perhaps exchange out a living or an organic material for that non-living plastic material. Your objective should be to decrease plastic and even eliminate it totally from your classroom and increase living in organic materials. So how do you do that? One of, one of the ways to do that is to understand that um, the difference between what is nature and what, what is natural materials. If you look at this image, you can see examples of nature and you can see an example of a natural material. Nature is the real thing. Natural materials are things that are made out of nature. So let's take a closer look at that. So nature would be anything like tree pods and pine cones and seashells and sticks and river rocks and driftwood and bamboo pieces. Those are nature. And of course, the living things such as the real, actually living at this point, um, things like live plants or fish or animals. So that's nature. Equally important are natural materials such as wicker baskets and woven placemats like wooden woven placemats or wicker or bamboo placemats, terracotta, wood and tile pieces, wooden bowls, pottery and textiles. So you can see in this image that there are some examples of natural materials. There's the picture frames, made out of wood, there's the tree cookies made out of wood, there's the, the textile, the, the uh, woven rug, you can see uh, the woven basket in the back. So be sure when you're thinking about nature and infusing nature into the classroom, don't just think about that plant and don't just think about that fish or the gerbil or the hamster, but also think about natural materials and all the time, considering how you can eliminate plastic in your classroom. So nature and seals bathing, you can see here how the director of the center, this is a dot to dot academy in um, California. She had tree cookies and she actually put them, installed them on her reception desk at the entry of her center. Here's, here's an idea which I love, which is um, planting plants, children plant plants into tin cans. Be careful of the sharp edges. Make sure that you pay attention to that and hang it on a rod. Another example of that would be from the kitchen comes great big industrial commercial size um, uh, 
cans that you could plant your garden in. So all the time thinking about how I can get rid of plastic and how I can instill nature. Here the toddlers painted um, the, the bark of a tree that had fallen and they had found it out in the play yard. How about instead of plastic containers, you could have children make their own containers. Um, these containers were made out of sticks. The children just made four sticks and made a container and where the children actually put numerals in um, matching corresponding river rocks and all sorts of natural materials. I love this idea. This idea I found in Central Michigan University, the teacher had taken the back off from frames and taken the glass out of the frames, taken the wire off the frames and had actually used the frame for a container. So the empty frame was the container. And then she made little tiny tree cookies from a tiny branch and she had put on the letters of the alphabet in upper and lower case and children could create their own words and their own um, letter alphabet train inside the frame. You notice there's three examples of nature or natural materials. There's the wicker basket, there's the wooden frame, and there's the tree cookies. Okay, so the second principle that we're going to talk about is color generates interest. The whole idea behind this principle is that we need to use color intentionally. Can we not use primary colors at all in a classroom? That is not the point. We can use primary colors. You can see this wall is painted a, a dark, a kind of burgundy red. And the rug in, in this area is very colorful. It's not to say that you can't use color in your classroom, but what it is to say is that you need to use color intentionally with lots and lots of intention. We know that research indicates that too many primary colors may negatively impact children's behavior. There's some research out there, recent research that's getting a lot of press in it. The researchers put a very colorful um, piece of wallpaper on the wall and then on the table, which was right next to the wall, the researcher put another colorful wallpaper kind of sample on the table. And then she gave, these were kindergartners, she gave kindergartners a task to do. And she measured the time and the focus that the kindergartners had on the task when that was a very overly decorated um, surface on the table and an overly decorated right next to it surface on the wall. What the researcher found was that the, when the children had the overly decorated surfaces that they didn't do as well, didn't do as good as when they, the surface was plain. When the surface was just a plain color they did much better. So what the researcher concluded was that the over-decorated classroom, the over-decorated wall, the over-decorated table, the over-decorated rug with all the stuff on it has a tendency to distract children. They don't have the ability to focus in on what they're working on because they have to filter out everything that's around what they're working on. So the researcher concluded that perhaps we should think seriously about what we put on our walls and what we put on our floors because she found that overly decorated walls and over-decorated surfaces uh, created a hindrance and a barrier to children's attention to task, focus on tasks, completion of task and the ability to just focus in 
for a, a few moments. So remember that when you're putting things up on your wall and remember that when you're selecting your rug, you might wanna think about less decorated walls and less decorated um, rugs. The other thing to think about is in color with the is the idea of thinking about a color palette. If you go into a New York City loft, a New York City loft where you open up the front door and you can pretty much see everything, the bedroom, except you don't see the bathroom, of course, but the bedroom, the living room, the kitchen, they're sort of all in one area. And in order not to create a hodgepodge in this New York City loft, most of the time, the design is one color palette. So consider your classroom. Maybe you have a certain color rug. Maybe you have a certain color wall. Maybe you have a, um, a certain color um, table or a certain color piece of furniture or maybe a piece of artwork. Take that color and use it as inspiration for your color palette and see if you could try to, it doesn't happen immediately, but see if you can try to create an inspiration color palette based on something that you already have in your room. For example, this classroom was with, which was at Children's Discovery in Ohio, um, the wall, the bottom part of the wall was that color. And so they picked up on that inspiration with the the, the runner, the table runner, with some of the colors that they put into the curio cabinet and colors, the you notice the little hand cloth on the front of the sink. They picked up on those colors that was already present in the classroom. Here's another idea. This is from um, the Children's Discovery Center also is that they picked up on the color palette of the rug that they already had. And so they decided to use that color palette. You see, it's, it's primary colors, that's fine. But what they did is they bought some inexpensive lanterns and hung them from the ceiling. You notice a little placemat in the middle of the table. Some of the images and the pictures are all based on that color theme. They even went as far as the rugs that they selected, the other rugs that they selected. So consider this for just a minute. This was a project that I did in Fairbanks, Alaska for the US Air Force. And when I walked in, this is what the classroom looked like. And you can see, I bet you can guess what color palette I was gonna pick up on because of the wall. That wall was like a cloth, like kind of like a carpet, kind of type of uh, wall and um, the rug you see on the floor also, and you can see the edging on the table and you can see the blue in the furniture that's to the left of, of the image. You can see the blue chairs. So that's, that's kind of like the colors. I thought, well, maybe I need to use that as my in color inspiration. inspiration. Maybe I need to use that as how I'm going to inspire, how I'm going to design the classroom. So this is what I came up with. I came up with the idea, let me go into Target or Myers or somewhere, you can even go to a Goodwill store. And I found a piece of fabric. This was actually a flimsy curtain. And I hung a curtain rod up and I just hung that brown curtain. So I picked up a little bit of the brown in the rug. And then I found happened to find at, at the, a surplus store, the carpet that you see underneath the, the home living area. The, the lampshade that you see hanging from the ceiling is an empty lampshade. It's hung from some fishing line. And I just put that over. So I took the color blue and the color brown and I sort of try to figure out how to emphasize it in the, the, the design. You see the picture that's in under right under the, the curtain? Um, that picture I found um, at, at a recycle shop. And actually it was um, birch wood. And I liked it because 
outside the classroom window, there were birchwood trees. And I like to bring the outside in and maybe incorporate it into your design. So the color palette extended even further. And if you notice on the left at the bottom, um, that rug that looks like a beige rug, it really isn't a beige rug. It's a multicolored, uh, multi-shape colors. Um, I've forgotten what else was on the rug, but that actually, it was a new rug, um, new to the classroom and didn't want to have that was primary colors. I wanted to follow my color palette of blue and brown. And so we just flipped it over. And so sometimes backs of rugs work just as fine. If you happen not to have enough money to go out and buy a new rug, maybe you can flip yours over and see if you can use the back of it. So now the third principle is called furnishings to find space. The whole idea behind this one is the placement of furniture is important as the furniture itself. We know that research indicates that the types of furnishings impact children's language, but also how you place the furniture impacts their development, their behavior, either positively or negatively. In this particular image, which was taken in um, New Zealand at a wonderful kindergarten program in New Zealand, you can see many examples of authentic furniture. Not only authentic furniture, but authentic materials that are on the little shelf in the back of the image. We know that if you include, I just yesterday put an authentic sterling silver teapot that I had found at a recycle shop into um, a classroom that we were working in. I was working in yesterday and it is so fascinating. The plastic teapot was there as well as the um, new sterling silver teapot that I bought for two bucks. Um, and the children gravitated towards that sterling teapot. It was authentic they could relate to that sterling teapot a lot more than I think they can relate to a plastic teapot. So when you're thinking about furnishings and you're thinking about materials for children, try always, 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 if you can, to swap out and exchange out authentic things for non-authentic or pretend things. The other thing to think about in this principle is the placement of furniture. We have a tendency to, um, to crowd our children. We have a tendency not to give them enough space. I recently learned of a, a term called gracious circulation. And gracious circulation means the ability for children to circulate without necessarily touching each other. This is especially important for children with ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, children who have experienced trauma, especially physical trauma. Those children are not um, comfortable, some of those children are not comfortable with other people touching them. And so if you have spaces that are too small, that children are touching each other all the time, that might not necessarily be the best design for children with ACEs, but also all children, I think. So consider gracious circulation when you're designing your, um, your classroom. And an example of that is this. I was in a classroom, this was in Texas, and when I first walked into the classroom, this is what I saw. It's, I thought it was charming at the beginning. Um, I loved the curtains. I loved all the authentic things that were on the wall and in the center. And I just thought, wow, this is really, this is really charming. And then I realized nobody was in the center. They were all next door to this um, group meeting area. And they were playing with their dolls in the group meeting area. And then I took another look at this center and I thought, oh my goodness, 
it's so cramped. If there were more than two children in there, if there were even two children in there, it would be hard to open up the refrigerator door. There just isn't enough room. And there's only one way in and one way out of the center. It's right there in the front of the image. This center does not have gracious circulation. So after I took a look at it and realized, ooh, I don't think it's working as much as I thought it might be working in the first place, I decided to reimagine the space. And so I took it over to another space, which had more room, and I reimagined it. And you can see here, first of all, there's lots, lots of room for gracious circulation, right? Second of all, there's more than one way to get into the center. When you're designing your learning centers, try not to push the ends of your shelving units against the wall. Rather pull them out like I did, and you can see on the right, um, the right shelving unit, pull it out so children can get in to the learning center between the end of the shelving unit and the wall. So make another entryway in. Also make it so children can see what they get into the center, what the, how what they are going to see or do in the center before they actually get in the center. So try not to put anything in the front, the front face of centers. Like you see here, there are no shelving units. A child can immediately see what's available to him. He doesn't have to go into a little little um, entryway and then get into the center before he sees what's available to him. Try gracious circulation. I love that new term I learned. Okay, next principle is texture, texture add step. Infuse both kinesthetic and visual texture into the classroom. I think we talk a lot about, or we think a lot about that kinesthetic texture with children, with our sensory tables, but too often we don't really think about visual texture in our classroom. Visual texture is very, very important. Um, we know from the research that adding visual texture to our classroom increases children's visual, spatial, and physical skills. Um, it also, I believe, promotes readiness skills. So for example, if you add the texture of a pine cone and a child looks at a pine cone, a real pine cone versus a plastic pine cone, that there's lots of visual texture and kinesthetic texture that children can experience with that real authentic pine cone. And because they're, the child's looking at it longer, they may be wondering about it. Remember lifelong learning and wonder? They may be wondering about it. That increases their observational skills. And observational skills are very, very important when children learn how to read, like learning the difference between a lowercase b and a lowercase d. That takes observation skills. So that's the reason why we want to increase our visual texture in the classroom such as this doesn't look like a lot of visual texture, but it really is. It's children painting on real wood and the, the, the grain of the wood creates that visual texture. I saw this idea in um, seedlings uh, childcare out in California. I loved it. It's just a piece of, of tile. It's just a piece of tile and it's all connected in the back and they just put it on the tabletop and it just increased the visual texture. And it was just a wonderful way to not only visually create texture, but also uh, kinesthetically create texture. And one of the activities that they were doing in the classroom the day that I was there was they were taking paper and putting it on top of the tile and doing rubbings. Another way to increase visual texture is let children help you do the job. 
So ask children if they can bring in things from home, anything that they want, just something from the um, junk drawer in the kitchen, something that they may have found in their bedroom, anything that um, might be of interest to them. And so the teacher had them bring in all these little um, things. And then she had a, um, a, a top from a, a duplicating um, box, paper box. And she had gathered different tops from boxes. And she let the children glue the objects onto the, the box, the lid of the box. And then when the children weren't there, she spray painted them all one color. And then they made the together, they made a collaborative display. And what it becomes is not only did they, can they visually see the texture, but they also experience the kinesthetic texture of making. And furthermore, it's the pride of, and, uh, and the collaboration of working together to create a beautiful display for the classroom. If you teach little guys, this is a great way to increase texture in the classroom. These are just dollar store frames with the uh, glass taken out and wallpaper, textured wallpaper samples were put on and then they Velcroed them, double, double stick Velcro to the end of a shelving unit or you can do it onto the back of the shelving unit. And when the wallpaper wears out from the children touching them, especially in the toddler room or the infant room way down low, you just uh, pop off the frame from the Velcro and exchange it out. And you've got new textures, new colors, new things to explore with the children. I love this, era, this idea, this came from Fullerton College with Sonia Samana and it, she found this at a home goods store, I think she said, but it just was a wonderful um, addition of texture and it wasn't too expensive. So think about some ways that you can incorporate texture into your furniture. And maybe you can do that by going to a Goodwill store, Habitat for Humanity, some kind of a recycle store. You can find lots and lots of texture if you just start looking. Here's a great way is um, don't forget bamboo placemats. Um, this tabletop experience actually had three placemats, the leaf one in the back, the green one, and the brown one in the front. And think about all the texture that that adds to this experience. I developed this little experience on the top of a block shelf, and it's nothing more than wicker and bamboo um, placemats a few river rocks that I found hanging out in the classroom, a little bamboo basket that I turned upside down, some leaves that I found about, and the dinosaurs and the plastic animals from the block center. When you put it on top of something new like this, the top of this black shelf, when you put something that's familiar with them, that they're used to in a familiar spot like the dinosaurs were in the black corner, when you put them in a new and different place, oh my goodness, look at all the interest that happens. So texture invites exploration, uh, adding seashells, rocks, cloth placemats, bamboo placemats. Children are encouraged to explore. They, they can have lots of fun manipulating and reimagining this scene and any other scene that you put out. Lots and lots of texture with it. Okay, so the next one is displays enhance environments. The whole idea behind this is to display children's work with honor in an orderly environment. Orderly environment is the key word. Research indicates that children need order and simplicity in order to be effective learners. Remember that study that I, I just told you about? They need order and simplicity in their world. They cannot make a lot of sense of too much clutter, too much clatter, too much overload, even on the shelves. 
consider your shelves and think about curating them rather than just stocking them full with lots and lots and lots of stuff. Curate your shelves, put less on your shelves, make sure that there's space between the objects that you put on your shelf and then exchange out on a regular basis. You will find that children will become more engaged when less is there. Less is more. Organize your space. Use things like this kitchen utensil canisters or waste paper baskets for recyclables or loose parts. I like this idea, especially because you can see through. And finally, honor children's work. The whole idea behind honor, honoring children's work is this. If you're about ready to hang up or place a child's piece of artwork or a child's piece of work, if you're about ready to display it or hang it up, think to yourself, would I put this in my home or would I hang this up in my home the way it is right now? If the answer is no, then don't do it. Figure out how to honor children's work by framing it or displaying it in unusual ways like this, just these are just unit blocks or hanging it from the wall. Or if you can't hang it from the wall, maybe you can buy like this teacher did is she bought a chair, she cut off the legs, she painted the chair and now the chair rests on top of the children's cubbies with um, children's artwork on top of it. Unique ways that this is a men's coat hanger. Find unique ways to hang up children's artwork. Always, always decide and always think about what you have on your walls. Most of the time we have commercially purchased product on our walls. Consider taking the purchase, commercially purchased products down and offsetting them with child-made displays, such as take down the alphabet poster and let children make the alphabet poster. Okay, principle number six, elements heighten ambiance. The whole idea behind this one is to infuse space with several types of ambience, such as light, sound, and smell. The whole idea behind this is research indicates that sensorial elements, kinesthetic, auditory, visual, olfactory, they support Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, how children learn in different ways. So the importance behind this is to always include not just visual, not perhaps just auditory, but include all sorts of experiences for children so we can support their ways of learning. Even a fresh bouquet of flowers in the classroom, this was actually picked, you know, on the way to work. How about mirrors, large unbreakable mirrors? That is a wonderful element. You can put large unbreakable mirrors either on the floor or on a tabletop, but large unbreakable mirrors are wonderful for increasing ambiance in the classroom. Children love them and they learn so much from working with their reflection and the reflection of objects. Make sure those objects though are not plastic and that they're authentic. And the best kind for mirrors is of course, shiny stuff. So one of the ideas behind this principle is to say no to fluorescent lights. We have all sorts of research that tells us fluorescent lights are not good for children, especially children with um, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. The, uh, they do not like that buzz. That, that is discomforting to them. So say no to fluorescent lights. If you can, turn them off. If you can, use use natural light or also use ambient light. Say yes to ambient light. These are battery powered. You, you plug them in, charge them up during the night and then they can go anywhere 
that you want them to go. You don't need a cord. You don't need an outlet. So those are wonderful. Um, infuse three levels of lighting, if you can, from the ceiling, from the floor in mid midsection. So in this case, in this image, you see actually see a floor lamp that's been tucked behind uh, a light table. And then um, that wasn't a real flower, that was a fake flower. A fake flower has kind of been butted up against it so you don't have to worry about the lamp um, turning over. Also, if you buy lamps um, uh, for ambient lighting, uh, try to buy some that have the, the bottoms on the lampshades. So in case the, the light bulb breaks or it gets knocked over, that you it, the light bulb will be contained in the, the, the shade itself. Um, always tuck um, the the cord behind something or under something. Um, always be sure that you follow that safety rule and um, keeping children safe. Providing multiple sources of lights like LED lights. LED lights are wonderful for children to handle. They don't get hot. Make sure that you use the fire approved LED lights but they allow children to manipulate light and be within light within their reach and they do not get hot, like, and they're virtually indestructible. Um, here's a glass block that's been purchased at a local home improvement store. It makes, a, there was a, a mini hole cut out of it at, I think I found this at Home Depot or the teacher found this at Home Depot and she just tucked an LED light and you can see the, the LED light going up to its source of power, that that makes a great light table. Don't forget auditory. Don't forget maybe a, a, a small table water, a water, small table water, a small water table. Like, um, uh, I can't find the right words. A water fountain, a small one that can be on a table. This one, the children actually made, um, which I thought was so clever. And the, the water fountain is tucked behind uh, the rock in the back. How about freshly potted herbs? Here's basil. Rosemary stuck in lumps of clay is wonderful. That's a wonderful auditory uh, and um, not auditory, it's wonderful. Um, a wonderful smell. My mind's not working right now. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I was going to finish up in 10 minutes here. Okay. The last one is the last principle is focal point attraction. Um, children's visual viewpoints are important to their interaction with the environment. We do have the research that says positive views from the classroom door helps children transition from their outside world to your inside world. So what you need to do is get it in the door jam of your, of your classroom door, scooch down to the height of the child that you serve and look to see what you see. If, and I just did this yesterday and it's so fun to do because what you see in as, a, as an adult is totally different than what a child sees at the child's height. So always design from the child's height, an empathic viewpoint, which is the user's end user's viewpoint. So scooch down to the height of the child, see what you can see, look to the left, look to the right, look straight ahead. If you see custodial things like table legs or cubbies or backs of cabinets or a mop and a broom or a, um, a waste paper basket, those are custodial things. Those do not attract attention of children. Not a positive. It doesn't make them want to, gee, I want to come in to, so I can see this garbage can. No, you need to create a, a reason for children to transition from their outside world to your inside world. So if you see custodial things, it's time to rearrange the room. Try a curiosity table, try a curiosity box, try something of interest right inside the classroom door. So let's look at a case study here. 
this is what a child would see in this one classroom that um, I reimagined. And what they really saw was the cots. And right behind the cots was this big um, gray steel cabinet. And I want you to notice the word friends on the sign that's right there in the middle of the image. So this is a child's view when they walked into their door. This is also when they walked a little bit further into the classroom, they saw a lot of backs of cabinets. And you see the, uh, the learning center there is, you can't see what's in the learning center because they uh, the cabinets are blocking the view. So that goes against that one principle of keeping the front of your learning center open so children can see into it. So there were two problems. The view wasn't so good, uh, and also the backs of cabinets were seen and really couldn't see what was going on in the classroom. Now take a look at this. See the word friends over to the right? I took, a, if you look further to the right, on the very far right, I took a cubby unit and turned it on its side because we didn't have anything. And I made it into a shelf. And then I made this little chair there. I just took the little chair from another place of the classroom and put it there. So when a child walks in, they see the, the, the bookshelf and they see the little book basket and they see the nice in, in, um, inviting chair. If you look to the far left in the back, that's where I put the gray cabinet. And if you could see inside the large storage um, closet that they had, that's where I put the shelves. If you look right in the middle of this image, you can see that uh, you can see into the home living area. I actually backed up the black corner on, on the back of the center. So the, the refrigerator and the sink and the stove are being backed up by two shelving units, which are filled with blocks. So nothing will ever tip over. So you can see um, the entrance and you can see what's in that center before you even go into it. Here's another example. This is the view from the door. Look at the table legs. That's what I'm talking about, table legs. Look at the backs of the cabinets. This isn't as interesting to a child as if they might see this. This is what they see now when they enter the classroom. Again, you can see what's inside the center before you get inside the center. And finally, here was the view from the door from a child's perspective. And this, you see that great big pole in the middle and right behind it, you see the home living area, but you, you walk, you had to walk along the back of these cabinets in order to get into the classroom at all. The back of the cabinets were black. The, on the other side was the black center. So take a look at that blue pole and this is what happened. There's the blue pole. And I used the blue pole as an anchor for the home living center, put the refrigerator against the blue pole. And you notice I put the black center way back in the corner. And I bet you didn't notice before those beautiful windows because they were being hidden by the um, black center um, shelving unit. So be sure to see and observe from your door what children see and make it interesting. I put the black corner way, way, way in the back of the classroom. So the bottom line of the focal point is to be sure that children can see from the door something interesting as they walk into the door and not backs of cabinets, and not table legs and not custodial things. So I also want you to think about the use of that light and how it was really being blocked by those cabinets. Always consider your light source and how beautiful light can be when it comes into the classroom. Never block your classroom windows with anything that you can't see through, um, like construction paper or posters or um, uh, fire exit signs or anything like that. Always keep your um, windows as clear and free of clutter as you possibly can. 
I want to talk about one more thing about the view and children's perspectives, and that is your view from the middle of the room. We just talked about the view from the door, but also the view from the middle of the room. Squat down or scooch down to the height of the child in the middle of your room. Look to your left, look to your right, look in front of you and look behind you. <clears throat> if you see backs of cabinets, or if you can't see thing, anything exciting from the middle of the room, which where children are a lot of the time, we have some research on behavior movements of children and they spend a lot of time in the middle of the room. If you can't see something exciting or something fun to do, or if you can't see into at least one of your learning centers, you might wanna think about redesigning your classroom and seeing if you can open up the view and let, let the view become more transparent to those young learners. So finally, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. And I think that's what this whole presentation has been about. We don't need to fix children. What we need to do is we need to fix the environment so children can actively and positively engage with the materials and engage in the environment and the way we have constructed it, the way we have designed it. It's our issue. It's not the child's issue. If the child isn't engaging, if the child is not acting according to how you feel he might be needing to act, then what you need to do is you need to do something about it. You need to fix the environment and not fix the child it's himself or herself. So thank you very much for your attention. If you want to get a hold of me, there's my website. I'd love to see any before and afters as a result of your listening to this presentation. If you have before and be sure to take before and take after. And I'd love for you to send them off to me. Um, it would just be a great thrill for me to be able to um, be able to share your learning and to um, maybe share with me what you've learned from this presentation. So thank you. Dr. Duncan, wow. I really love the fact that you brought to light that teachers are we're, we're problem solvers. We look for that solution and our children don't need fixing. What we need to do is become that reflective practitioner and use our resources to really create the best environment for our students. I also appreciate the fact that this might change. So one class, one year, one class, one week might need a different environment than um, another. And I think that's very important with the differentiated instruction and individualized approach piece. I'm going to go ahead and just stop the recording.